Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about catalytic leadership. I'm delighted to welcome special guest, Dr. William Attaway. Dr. William is a pastor, the founder of Catalytic Leadership, LLC, and the author of Catalytic Leadership, 12 Keys to Becoming an International Leader Who Makes a Difference. You can reach Dr. William and learn more about his book at catalyticleadershipbook.com, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Welcome, Dr. William. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Linda, thanks so much for having me on your show. It's an honor to be here. It is a privilege to be speaking with you, and I am pleased and excited to be learning about gaining some better leadership skills from you today. But is it okay if we start first with a little bit about your story? I understand that you had a daughter who was diagnosed with cancer, and that affects everything. Would you be willing to share your story and how that has affected you and even your faith and your leadership. Absolutely. So I'm married. I'm the husband to Charlotte, who we've been married for 24 years. We'll hit 25 this December. We have two daughters. Um, My older one just graduated high school uh, last week, actually. And so she'll be heading to college this fall. My younger one is a freshman, finishing up her freshman year in high school. Three years ago, my older daughter, when she was 14, started having some headaches. And we took her to the doctor and thought maybe she's developing migraines. I've had those since I was about her age. So we thought maybe that's what it is. But they persisted and we go back to the doctor and and just kept kind of circling this and trying to figure out what it was and eventually went to the ER, had some tests run. And they discovered that she had a tumor on the back right side of her brain. And very unexpected. We had no, there's no history. There's no indicator this is going to be just out of the blue. Well, like so many things are in life, right? You can't script it. You don't plan it. And that started a journey. Two days later, you know, she, she was taken to the emergency room or taken to the hospital that night by ambulance where they, two days later, they did the surgery. And then two days after that, they sent her home and we waited for the biopsy results. Those weeks, you know, you, you can imagine, I'm sure, you know, you're just kind of on pins and needles waiting to see what this is, hoping and praying that this is not cancer. But it turns out that it was. It's a very rare form of cancer. Only about 50 teenagers a year in the world are diagnosed with it. And so that started a journey for us. You know, that was March of 2019. And, and for the, the weeks and months that followed with, with treatments and radiation and the Ronald McDonald House and so many, so many elements of that story, it, it really impacted all of us in, in, some, in some different ways. Uh, one of the things that I took away from that season uh, was what mattered truly the most. I've taught for years that, you know, if you're a person of faith like I am, that your relationship with God is first and then your spouse if you're married and then your kids if you have kids, and then everything else. The reason that that matters so much is because one day somebody else is going to sit in your chair at work. Somebody else is going to have the title you have. Somebody else is going to do what you do. I've I've spent a lot of time with people at the end of their lives, and, and I've heard a lot of stories. And I'll tell you, I've never heard anybody say, gosh, I wish I'd spent more time at work. (laughs) I wish I'd spent more time working on those KPIs and those quarterly objectives. If only we'd hit those goals and made those achievements. What I hear are regrets, regrets around relationships that were never mended or time that was not spent with people. And I believe we have the opportunity to be proactive and learn from the ditches that other people have fallen into or driven into. We can be proactive. And so what that season did for me and and my leadership and my family was it, it underlined and underscored how important how important this really is to to be family focused as a leader, understanding that you determine your priorities, you schedule according to your priorities. Um, nobody else is going to do that for you. One day, somebody else is going to sit in the chair you sit in at work. Who's going to be with you when you don't? It's those closest to you. Wow. And quick update. She is okay now, right? She's doing great. She okay. We're three years out from her diagnosis. There has not been a recurrence. Uh, they, they, they did the surgery, took it out, did the radiation, and we have had no recurrence since then. And we just are so grateful to God for that. I am so grateful as well. And as you're explaining that it was a tumor in her brain, my heart is just pounding because my daughter also has a tumor in her brain. And it oh, is a goodness. rare form of cancer. Um we're oh, not I, we're not through yet. Um, it is one of those yeah. strange situations where it doesn't respond to chemo or radiation. It only uh, can be removed by surgery. And she has had one, and there's just a oh, little bit goodness. left wrapped around her carotid artery. Um, and they yeah. they're going to have to go back and get it later. So anyway, whew, yeah, that's tender and very very real. So as we're talking yes. about real things that go on in our personal lives. 
And now we're trying to be able to work in whatever capacity we are as a leader. And, and family is also a leadership role. But yes. as we're trying to, to do, do these kinds of things, and, and when we have things going on at home, it, it makes things challenging. But I appreciate that you said that your experience has helped you uh, even hone in even more what your, what your goals, what your objectives, and what your priorities are. And so that's beautiful that we can learn how to be powerful, effective leaders and not yes. have that be at the expense of our families, of things yes. that really, truly matter. And so I, I really appreciate that uh, because it matters. So can you please explain what catalytic leadership is and what, how do we do that? Sure. So when I went to college, I went as a, chem as a pharmacy major. And so I went and I took chemistry or inorganic chemistry, organic chemistry. And then at organic chemistry, I decided that I really don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this. <laughs> so <that's, laughs> at that point, I decided to change direction. Um, but in my brief chemistry studies that first year and a half, I learned the power of a catalyst in chemistry. And a catalyst is something that is introduced to incite or to accelerate significant change to make a powerful impact. And, you know, I've been a student of leadership since I was 15. I had a high school teacher who invited me to my first leadership conference because he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And for, for over three decades now, I've, I've studied and learned from leaders. And as I thought about a catalyst, I thought, you know, every great leader I've ever met or learned from or learned about, they would resonate with that. This idea of, of inciting or accelerating significant change to make a powerful impact. Like they, they would really resonate with that because that's what they're trying to do. And so I thought, what, what is it that makes a leader catalytic? And, and so the book is actually an outgrowth of so many conversations that I've had with other leaders as I've coached leaders for 20 plus years now. So many things that I've learned in my own journey, being a leader for, for almost 30 years now. And, and what I've learned in studying and talking to so many other leaders, both reading about them from history and from, from places I'll never be, uh, but I think you can learn from anybody. So the book is, is actually the, the encapsulation of, of so many of those conversations and those learning in my journey and the journeys of others. That's fantastic. And isn't it wonderful that those courses that you did not love and knew that that's <laughs> not what you wanted to be still gave you some insight to be able yeah. to make what you do want to do uh, more concrete, more uh, to be able to find that exact word that means what you're trying to do. And as leaders, isn't that really what we are trying to do? We, we don't try to do everything ourselves. We're trying to light that flame so that we can get other people to be able to rise to their potential and to be able to, yes. so we can all get things done together because we're so exactly. much more powerful when we work as a group than when we're trying to do things by ourselves. And you really can't be a leader without, you know, some followers anyway, right? No, you can't. <laughs> The goal as a leader is not to get things done. The goal as a leader to get the right things done through other people, Ooh. through teams. That's our that's our goal, right? If you're trying to do it all yourself, that's not leadership. That's something else. Isn't that crazy? Um, and I'm thinking about the concept of servant leaders, where there is a lot of work involved. So, how would you kind of describe that, and how would that fit within the realm of catalytic leadership? Now, I heard Patrick Lencioni talk about servant leadership years ago, and he said, we talk about servant leadership like there's any other kind. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I thought, that's so brilliant, because the fact of the matter is leadership is servant leadership. If it's not, we need to call it something else, because that's what that is. It, it's demagoguery or it's manipulation or, or something else. Servant leadership, leadership is servant leadership. That's what it is. It's, it's understanding that, that my job as a leader is not to see what I can accumulate for myself. It's not about my benefit. Leadership is about taking what's been put in my hands and using it for the benefit of those around me, those that I lead, those that I serve. That's what leadership actually is in every context, no matter what. Wow. And the other options are like demagoguery. Was that? I was thinking despotism, <laughs> tyranny. Yeah. So leadership is, is servant leadership. 
Oh, okay. That is absolutely beautiful. I'm going to be chewing on that one for a little while. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So how can we be a conduit and not just a reservoir? I know you mentioned that. What does that mean? I think I am such a beneficiary of so many people who have invested and poured into my life from the time I was, you know, 15, right? When this, when this teacher begins to pour into and invest in me by sending me someplace to experience something I never experienced. And I began to study and learn from leaders that, that I had never encountered before. I'm the beneficiary of that. And for over 30 years, I've attended conferences and seminars and workshops, and I've, I've bought more coffees and lunches than I can remember with people who are farther down the road than me so that I could ask them questions and ask, you know, how is it that you're doing what you're doing in this area? Because I want to learn. I'm the beneficiary of all those experiences, all those conversations, all those teachings. But that's not just for me. Every experience in your life is not just for you. You can think it is, and then you become a reservoir of all that. And you're kind of holding it all back in just for you. I think there's a better way, and that's to be a conduit. A conduit so that everything that is invested in you, you understand is not just for you. It's for the benefit of those around you. And you become a conduit, and that begins to flow through you to other people around you so that they get to benefit from it too. I think that's a better way than just saying more for me, me, me. And as a leader, I'd again say, is there any other way? Because that doesn't even make any sense. And as I'm listening to you, I'm just so impressed that you were not only listening and attending conferences, you took the extra step to go to lunch, to ask some questions, to allow these people to be your mentors, to be able to learn a little bit more and a little bit deeper. And that gives you kind of that cutting edge of saying, you know, I want this, I value this, and I value what you have to to share with me. And I think that that's a a beautiful way to gain new skills. So very well done. It's an opportunity. You know, if if, I'm not going to say there are no forum, I'm not going to tell you every time I've reached out and said, hey, can I buy you coffee or buy you lunch? I don't get a yes every time, not by a long shot. But I'm not going to say there are no forum. You know, I'm not, the only way I get a yes is if I make the ask. Wow. So by not asking, you have already said no on their behalf. On their behalf. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. How many times do we do that? Uh, A lot. Far too often. (laughs) Right? I'm not going to say their no for them. Okay. Thank you. If they say no, okay. I'm no worse off. But what if they say yes? Wow. And you are able to not take it personally if somebody says no. No, 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 because it's not personal. They don't know me. (laughs) (laughs) Could it be personal? (laughs) They have no idea who I am. There's just this random person like emailing them saying, hey, can I buy you coffee? They don't know who I am. But I'll tell you, you know, maybe 50% of the time I get a yes. And then I get the privilege of coming prepared, always come prepared with questions, always come prepared with what you want to talk about, because that's how you honor them and honor their time. And I always take notes because my memory, for one, is not perfect. And second, I think that communicates that I'm valuing what they're sharing. Yes, it does, because you came on both ends prepared. First you asked, then you came prepared, and then you took notes. You you showed at every level that you valued what they have to offer. That's amazing. Okay, so besides your example, which is quite amazing, say someone is put into a new leadership position. Can you give them some advice so that they can get started? The first thing I would do coming into a new role is I would listen a lot. I would ask more questions. I would ask more questions than you speak statements at least three to one. There is an organizational dynamic. There is a team dynamic. There is history, right? There's there's organizational identity and DNA, and you don't know any of that yet. So if you walk in thinking that you're just going to start speaking into it and bringing change and bringing new ideas, and I'm just going to come and just, you know, blow things up, that may be exactly what you do. (laughs) So I would be very, very careful. Ask three times as many questions as you make statements. Come in, listen, take notes. When you do that, you're going to begin to understand how that team, that department, that organization works. And then and only then are you going to be in a position to be able to say, well, hey, have we ever thought about this? 
have we ever thought about doing things like this? Have we ever thought about trying this? Then you earn the right to be heard. When you walk in just full of, of, of blusteriness, you're not earning anything. Wow. And as we think about the concept of catalytic leadership, here we are. The goal is exactly to blow things up, not, not really blow things up, but to, to, to create change. Yes. And I love that that begins with listening and yes. understanding rather than walking in with this command, this is how it's going to be. And I imagine not only then are you understanding and your decisions are going to be better and more applicable to what's going on, but I love that you made the suggestions through questions rather yes. than, okay, now we're going to be taking a new direction. It is, you know, that's the way you've done it, but it's all wrong. It was, have you thought about this? And then that helps people get buy-in so that you're not fighting them to create this change, but instead yes. we are on the same page making this change together because it's better, not just yes. different but better. That's it. If you walk in and you start trying to change things you don't understand yet, my question is, how do you know you're changing the right things? Ooh. You might be, you might be trying to fix something that isn't broken and you may not be addressing something that really needs fixing. That's absolutely true. Begins with asking questions listening, paying attention, and probably with the same kinds of things that you did at your lunches, your business lunches, where it's, Absolutely. I'm going to come with my set of questions. Yes. I'm going to listen and I'm going to take some notes. And then from there, then I'll be able to uh, make or ask some questions uh, to be able to pinpoint. Because sometimes uh, having a, a fresh set of eyes, a fresh perspective, because a lot of times we, we go into default leadership. Uh, we do what's always been done. Because that's, right. that's what's been done. And there's uh, some safety in doing what's already been done. Because if you change things and things don't go fabulous, then you get blamed. But if you do the exact same thing that everybody else has done and it doesn't go fabulous, say, hey, it's not my fault. That's just the way we do things, right? Everybody's doing it, right? <laughs> the fact is growth only happens on the other side of change. Mm. That's true for me personally as a leader. That's true for you as a leader. That's true for a team, a department, or an organization. Growth only happens on the other side of change. But how do you know what to change? You have to listen. You have to ask the right questions if you want to get the right answers. One of my favorite books is Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. Brilliant book about the value of asking the right questions. That's a skill, and it is a skill far too few leaders have and try to develop. Yes. And I'm thinking about the role of leadership in a family as well and how valuable those same skills are yes. of asking the right questions rather than stepping in and trying to demand something. Hmm. Yeah, the, the days of leadership being something where you demand compliance with other people, where you send missives out from your corner office and expect everybody to just do what you say, um, the, if those days ever existed, they are far in the past. I'm not sure they ever existed because that's not leadership to begin with, as we've already talked about. Not good uh, leadership, the fact, anyway. The fact of the matter is, it's a relationship. And you have to see people as people, as individuals, as human beings. And you have to listen. And you have to listen to what is said and what is under what is said. And when you do that, then, then, then you earn the relational right to be heard. If you're just leaning on your title. If you're just leaning on the, the, the title on your business card as your leverage to get things done with people, you're going to find that's, that's a, a very short stick with which to get leverage. Indeed. And isn't this wonderful that when you do it right, it creates a win-win situation? Exactly. It is a win for the leader and it is a win for the people that you are leading. Because right. they also are seen and valued and they matter. And man, when I feel like I am seen and valued and that I matter, then I have a lot more buy-in and I have a lot more uh, loyalty, I would say. Absolutely. And there's less friction because I feel like we're going the same direction and that this is intended also to benefit me. And that matters. 
It does. This is why I think it's so important that leaders understand that their role is not just to get things done. Right? It's to get things done, the right things done through other people. And the only way you're going to do that is to get to know them, to know what's in their heart, their hopes, their dreams. And, and I, my privilege as a leader is to help them to accomplish those things, both inside and outside the organization. I want to lift them up and empower them and equip them and inspire them to do that. And you know what happens when you do that? You, you communicate how much they matter, not just because of what they do on your team, but because of who they are, because they're valuable, because they matter. And when you do that and when you show that and when you show it over time, my experience has been people lean in. And they lean in to your team and your organization, just like you said, in your department. And they say, hey, you know, I want to I want to be a part of building it. And they're going to be all in in a way they never were before. And is this leadership coaching? Is this what you provide? It is. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, with leaders because I think that that's how we get better. I've had a leadership coach for years. And the challenge for every one of us is it is very difficult to see the whole picture when you're in the frame. You can see your perspective, you're, but you're in the weeds, and all you can see is what you can see. I need somebody from the outside, somebody who can see what I can't see and help me to see what I can't see, and who can ask me the right questions, and who can ask me questions that maybe nobody else in my world is going to ask. That's the value of a coach. And the secret sauce of coaching is accountability. That we're going to have this conversation. We're going to talk about this. We're going to, he's going to ask me the right questions. And then the next time we meet, he's going to say, hey, that thing we talked about, what'd you do with that? Mm. Oh, yeah. See, that's that's the power. And so this is what I do for leaders. And what I've done for a couple of decades now is I help leaders in, in a variety of different fields, from solopreneurs and entrepreneurs to C-suite types, to educators, to government contractors and government employees. It doesn't matter the field because the fact is leadership is leadership. Principles are principles. And I ask questions and I ask I try to ask the right questions to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve and overcome what they can't understand yet, what they can't see. And when they recognize it, then they're able to say, OK, now let's put together a path forward. And then I help them with accountability to achieve that. And that makes all of the difference, because as I like to say, it change comes from a combination of learning and doing and yes. just learning some wonderful principles on leadership in and of itself, I guess, would make me a reservoir. And until I apply them, then right. that would make me more of the conduit. And that That's is right. when the change takes place. And this is a place where uh, sometimes we fall a little short in, in yeah. the application. We learn and have good intentions and yeah. then don't follow through. And that creates, you know, some issues. So in addition to speaking directly with you, are there some tips to help people increase their accountability? their follow through so that you don't just hear this wonderful podcast with this great information that Dr. William is sharing. And then I say, this is so cool. And then I continue to do things like I've always done. <laughs> you know, I think there's a couple of things. I wrote the book that we just published earlier this year to capture a lot of the principles that are consistent threads with leaders over the decades that I've been coaching them and having conversations. They come out of those conversations and out of my own journey. And so in writing the book, my goal was to help help people that I may never meet or deal with personally, but that they can take and they can read and understand and apply and benefit from the experiences of other people, right? So that's, that's one way. I think that's that's a way that anybody can do that. You don't like to read? There's an audio book. That's okay. You know, <laughs> we've tried to make it in such a way that, that no matter how, what your learning style is, we want to help you get better. Um, that's That's one way. Another way is create a community around you that's going to help you to grow on purpose. Nobody grows accidentally. <laughs> Nobody wakes up one day and says, wow, I'm a, I'm a fully mature leader. I don't know how that happened. I, I didn't mean for that to happen, but here I am. It doesn't happen that way, right? Choose to grow on purpose. And, and that involves the people that you spend time with. That involves the community that you build around you. Build people around you who are going to invest in you, pour into you, and help you be the best version of you. Read books, listen to podcasts, attend conferences and workshops with people who are going to, to stretch you and help you to grow beyond where you are today. When you do these things intentionally and purposefully, you are moving toward the best version of you, the best leader you can be. Don't try to be somebody else. 
be the best version of you. And I appreciate that that there's more than one right way to do things and that there's more than one version of what's going to work and be good because uh, we're different and we're unique. And if we all had to be clones of you in order to be successful leaders, it would have, we'd be, have a hard time. (laughs) That's fantastic. So as we're working our way and purposefully growing and learning and how much time would you spend in this learning and growing process? When leaders, for example, they might feel overwhelmed and they're just trying to to go through the steps. So is there kind of a balance of how much I'm working on my day to day, trying to not, you know, totally get run over and learning and improving so that I can do better and be more efficient and more effective in the future? That I would say this, don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can you may recognize, hey, there's 15 things that I need to grow in. There's 15 things I need to, to learn to do better. Okay, fair enough. Please don't try to focus on 15 things at once. You're not going to make any progress that way. Pick one, pick two. Let's focus on those right now. Yeah, the other stuff will come and you'll get there. But don't say, I don't have time to focus on 15, so I'm not going to do anything. I, 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 don't, I don't have time. No one has time. Okay? It's like character development. Okay? Nobody ever is going to pay you to work on your character, but they will fire you if you don't. I heard Carrie Newhoff say that, and I think that's just so brilliant. Leadership development and growth is exactly the same way. People are not going to pay you to do this, right? Most of the time. But if you don't, you're going to negatively impact the team that you lead, the department that you're in, the organization you're a part of, and the mission you're trying to accomplish. So, If you want those things to go better, you have to choose to invest in you. Nobody has time. That's a a common objection, a common excuse. And it is just that. It is an excuse. You have time for the things you make time for. So do I. Absolutely true. So as I'm listening, I'm thinking, okay, one piece of advice is take one bite at a time to keep it small. And then the second is the incentive to realize that this is important and that it is worth uh, creating a space for. um, And that truly matters. So that's, that's absolutely brilliant. You're, you're taking people's excuses away. And I'm sure there are probably some people who are saying, dang it, that means I actually have to do something. That's everybody can carve out some time. Maybe you've only got 15 minutes. Then you've got 15 minutes. How can you leverage that? How can you invest that? Are you just going to like squander it like so many do? Are you going to let it drift away? Scroll through Facebook. Exactly. That will make me a better person, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Sure. No problem. Well, it depends on what you're aiming at. (laughs) Absolutely. What are you going to do purposefully? I carve out, I block out intentional time every week where I'm going to learn I'm going to grow. I'll read. I'll watch people's talks, videos. I will listen to podcasts. I carve out time, block it out. That's going to happen because I've made it a priority. Everybody can do that. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That makes it doable. You've created, for example, a specific time block. If we had 15 minutes, then I can spend, okay, I will invest 15 minutes And then you gave such wonderful suggestions. We have so many resources available at our fingertips. We have books, we have audio books, we have podcasts, we have YouTube videos. We have so many resources available that uh, it's it's not a lack of availability that's the problem. So, Not at all. We live in a day and a time when the resources and the opportunities are literally at our fingertips. We just have to choose. Right. We have to let our, our fingers do the walking in a place that is going to benefit us. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Dr. William, is there anything that you want to make sure that we cover before we close? I, I just enjoyed this so much. No, I think that the most important thing that I would that I would want people to walk away with, and it's what I call the one non-negotiable of catalytic leadership, and that is a teachable spirit. I think there is no such thing as a wasted experience. But it depends on us coming to every experience, every conversation, every relationship, every opportunity with a learning posture. We can learn from anybody. Sometimes 
we might learn what not to do, but that can be incredibly helpful. So I would say that is the most important thing. And if people can understand that and approach their lives and their leadership with a teachable spirit, with a learning posture, that can make all the difference. I love it. I love it. That is brilliant. Well, thank you so much for visiting with me today and sharing this very applicable wisdom. I hope it was helpful. And it's just been such an honor. Linda, thanks so much for having me on your show. Oh, it's been, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> In closing, I'd like to share a quote by John C. Maxwell. He said, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Today, I invite you to improve your leadership skills so you can help make the world a better place. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.